Hello and welcome to today's presentation, Terpene Evaporation, The Silent Profit Killer. Today's webinar is being presented by Virox Technologies, makers of shield disinfectants formulated with accelerated hydrogen peroxide. There will be a live Q&A at the end of this webinar, so please send in your questions at any time by entering them into the chat section and located on the right-hand side of your screen. So without any further ado, let's get started. I would now like to introduce our presenters, Brian Rice, Director of R&D at Boveda, and Scott Swale, Sales Executive at Boveda. Over to you. Thanks, guys. We're excited to be here and chat about terpenes and uh, what happens when terpenes evaporate. Just uh, reiterate, this is Brian Rice, our Director of R&D. He can give a little background on uh, his past experiences. And I am Scott Swale. I manage uh, the Canadian territory mm -hmm. for Boveda. We're happy to be here. Yeah, um, I've been at uh, Boveda for about uh, be four years, actually, this year. Um, but I've got an extensive background uh, on food, uh, beverages, uh, a lot of uh, about 20 years of uh, innovation and product uh, development uh, before coming to Boveda. So uh, excited uh, to come into uh, Boveda and start working on cannabis and all the other markets we uh, currently serve. So, uh, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, terpene evaporation, uh, the silent profit killer. And we'll go on to the next slides. Uh, five things that we'll touch on. Uh, first of all, if you guys don't know who and what Boveda is, we'll talk, uh, educate you a little bit on that. Uh, we're going to gain a little bit of understanding of water activity and why that is important for cannabis safety. Uh, obviously, we'll talk about terpene evaporation uh, and the monolayer that gets formed, which is what we're calling the terpene shield. Uh, and lastly, we'll talk about that sweet spot of driving uh, that water activity level uh, that helps drive quality uh, and essentially uh, economic gains moving forward. All right, so uh, who is Boveda? Uh, we're a privately held company founded back in 1997. We're headquartered around the Minneapolis area, and we defined and built the category of the two-way humidity control, uh, those wonderful little brown pou pouches that you see uh, on the bottom here. Uh, that is just one of the uh, many that we have in, in our arsenal. This is specifically the cannabis one at 62%. Uh, the primary markets that uh, we sell our pouches into, uh, obviously the premium cigars. Uh, we also sell these into music uh, and then the cannabis and hemp. Uh, those are the three primary, but a lot of our pouches are um, kind of served or sold into other markets, uh, into medical, into pharmaceuticals, uh, and just a wide range of other things. Uh, one of the interesting notes is, uh, I think Bovid has actually been in space, believe it or not. So uh, pretty cool stuff we get to uh, control humidity on. Uh, all right. So our Bovida patented technology essentially is we take uh, our pouches are comprised of a uh, biodegradable craft paper. Uh, we take a, a unique resin membrane and we extrude that onto the paper to make our big rolls of film. Uh, from that roll of film, we form them into pouches and we, we fill them with a saturated salt solution. Uh, since that's made up of food grade salts, uh, water, and a food grade thickening agent. Um, all of our pouches uh, use the same type of film, and it's all food grade, uh, uh, not only just the ingredients, but also uh, can come in contact uh, with food as well, uh, food safe. So um, those three things come together to make up our patented technology uh, that's uh, used in the market today. Okay, you might be asking yourselves, what is a two-way humidity control solution? Uh, very simply, uh, it can uh, when you take a bovida pouch and you place it in a container with a product, uh, what it will do is will add or remove water vapor as needed uh, to maintain the environment in the product at an ideal RH as printed on that pack. Uh, the unique thing about uh, the film um, is, is that it can pass water vapor very quickly uh, through the, the film to respond to the environment uh, to bring it to uh, that specific RH uh, that is required. Um, it's kind of like dialing in uh, to a predetermined RH, like setting a thermostat. All right, you put a boba to pack in to whatever RH is printed, uh, and it'll either uh, remove or add water as needed to maintain that relative humidity. Uh, one thing uh, Bova is not, it's not a one-way humidity controller. Uh, and what that means, uh, it's not a desiccant. A desiccant is always going to try to pull the water out. Uh, and then a humidifier is always trying to push water uh, uh, out into the environment. So um, if you combine those two together, a boba can act as a desiccant and a humidifier uh, when it's needed to, based upon the demand that's placed onto the pouch uh, inside that container. 
Okay, now we know a little bit about bovida, the pouches. Uh, let's dive into what water activity is. Uh, what water activity is, is basically an extreme measurement, uh, uh, extremely close and accurate measurement of the relative humidity uh, immediately adjacent to the product that is being tested. Uh, and that water activity measurement on that product uh, determines whether or not mold or fungus or other microbial growth can happen uh, on your product. Uh, in a nutshell, if that water activity is too high, it can result in mold growth and some other bad bugs can grow. Uh, if that water activity is low, uh, it can cause brittleness, uh, potentially loss of flavor, um, especially uh, in, in cannabis as well. And you can also experience potentially some oxidization that could occur. Uh, that relative humidity is basically a, a measurement of the free water that's present on a product. Uh, and it is exp expressed as AW, uh, and that is water activity. So, for example, if, uh, if I've got, you tell me that your product is sitting at 50% relative humidity, uh, essentially, that is point or a 0 0.50 water activity. You just move the decimal point over uh, to get the water activity measurement. Uh, and then specifically for uh, cannabis, that uh, specific measurement can tell you, again, um, whether or not you have mold uh, and also if it's in a, that bad or mold zone uh, to help you avoid some uh, potentially uh, risky or costly uh, uh, recalls. Uh, on the right-hand side is uh, um, basically this is captured directly from uh, some food safety uh, perspectives. Um, it is a chart that's showing you on the right-hand side kind of where some products reside or kind of fall within the water activity range. Uh, essentially, uh, on the top, you've got some fresh vegetables. Those are about 0.95 or 95%. Uh, and then if you go down the right side, all the way to dried fruits and caramels. Uh, those kind of hover around 0.6 and breads and, and so forth down there. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, you've got all the microbial growth can happen. Um, on the very bottom at 0.6 or 60% relative humidity or water activity is where you start to see some mold and some yeasts uh, start to uh, grow. They're dormant. But if you get them at that right stage of uh, water activity, they'll start to grow uh, and, and compound and get bigger and uh, start to spread. Um, and as you can go up the higher uh, towards uh, 90% or 100%, you can see where it's salmonella and botulism. So uh, if you can understand where your product falls within this range or on this spectrum, uh, you can understand where to keep it on, on a level below that's uh, safe uh, for water activity. Okay, so I mentioned what uh, the free water, right? So water activity is measuring the free water. Going to get a little deeper into here and, and understand uh, what I mean by free water. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, free water is basically water that can be easily be uh, extracted, squeezed, cut, or, or pressed uh, from an organic material. The water that uh, cannot be easily extracted is what we call bound water. Uh, the, the little picture on the right-hand side kind of depicts that. Uh, the free water is can move very freely in and out, and the bound water gets kind of tight together. Uh, if you combine both of those together, free water and the bound water, you've got total moisture content. Uh, and that's something that uh, right now is measured um, uh, in, in the cannabis industry as well as that moisture content. So you put those together, basically moisture content is the, the quantitative amount of water in that sample. Uh, how I kind of explain a little bit more, uh, if you take a free water, if you take a sponge that's are soaked in a bucket of water and you pick it up and the water is dripping from there and you squeeze it out, that's all free water. Uh, and you squeeze it as hard as you can and you press out as much water as you can. Um, that sponge will still feel a little wet. Uh, that feeling of still wet, that's what we call that bound water, right? It's really, really hard to, to get out and once to stay trapped within that uh, cellular matrix uh, of the material. Okay, so let's get to the big question. Uh, why is water activity a better measurement to determine cannabis safety and not total moisture content? All right. In order for us to understand this, uh, what has happened in a, several years ago is the Cannabis Safety Institute um, took, took several different strains of cannabis and they measured at what water activity level uh, would start to grow mold or yeast. And then they determined whether or not, uh, based upon all those samples, where that threshold was. On the right hand side uh, of this uh, slide, uh, you'll see the, the isotherm, what we're calling an isotherm here. Uh, anything below 0.65 in this zone right here uh, is actually very safe for cannabis. Um, 
anything above or in this zone to the right hand side of the 0.65, uh, that is where mold growth can happen. Uh, significant microbial growth can happen as well. Uh, so that's where they they determine uh, very closely um, where that safety threshold is for cannabis. Coming off of the Safety Institute, when they determine that 0.65 or 65% relative humidity, uh, ASTM drafted the first cannabis uh, standard, the D8197. And where this established, they drafted off of the Cannabis Safety Institute and said, all right, we need to keep cannabis safe, but what's that low end? And that low end for cannabis right now, uh, based upon the AOSTM standard, is at 55% to 65%. So, um, and that's for safe consumption uh, throughout uh, cannabis. So, uh, but I want you to look at this slide. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the isotherm. Uh, on the y-axis, we've got 14%, roughly around 14% moisture content. And that equates to, um, on this isotherm, which is an average of many different uh, strains, um, at 0.65. Remember that point, uh, remember that 14%. So uh, I guess some of the um, uh, the actions didn't come out here. But essentially what this is, is, a, uh, is an isotherm uh, for one different strain. And what happens on an isotherm, we'll take uh, a piece of cannabis and we'll subject it to uh, a, a high humidity within a container. And at each, uh, each point, as we increase the water activity or relative humidity, uh, you can see it starts to climb up on the bottom uh, portion of this isotherm. This is what we call the absorption side of this. Um, so as, as water, as the cannabis sample is increasing water activity uh, in moisture content, it gets to a point of equilibrium, right? It stops, uh, it gets static. It can no longer uh, absorb any more water. At that point, then cannabis starts to go down on the desorption side, and we're measuring the water activity as it relates to moisture content on the left-hand side to a point where it's so dry and no longer has any more water in it. And you can cycle this up and down, back and forth um, uh, on the same curve. Now, it's interesting, uh, and this is the most interesting part, is that uh, when I said 14% uh, moisture content, if I told you, or if you said, hey, Brian, my weed is at 14% moisture content, uh, that's not the accurate measure to determine how safety is. Uh, because if I took that 14% across this isotherm, you could essentially get two different water activity measurements. Uh, one being very high over that 0.65, which is 0.69. Uh, and then one is uh, low, right? 45. So if you don't know where you're at on this isotherm, um, as your cannabis is drying or curing or absorbing, uh, it's very important to measure the water activity uh, to understand where um the safety can can be for your cannabis. Now, the majority of us are sitting, uh, you know, obviously in a desorption side. You're going to cut and cure uh, after your harvest, so you're you're always pulling moisture out. So, um, safety, you know, majority of the time you're going to be on the desorption side. So, um, uh, that's kind of where we're at for cannabis uh, on the isotherm. So there are three things uh, we're going to talk about now. That uh, so now we understand about water activity, where that safety is. Uh, you know, know a little bit about uh, our product, uh, the Bovida can add or release uh, water vapor. There are, are three things here that uh, can evaporate that we need to, uh, we're going to touch on. Obviously, terpenes uh, and why it's important to maintain trichome health and uh, the creation of a monolayer. Uh, second is the moisture and weight, right? And why is that critical uh, to help maintain uh, that, help maintain that moisture to drive the economic impact? Uh, and then last uh, is the overarching right, cannabis quality brand reputation. If you get the first two, uh, that third uh, is just going to come inherently, right? Uh, you're going to prevent mold. You're going to prevent overdry bud. Uh, you're going to make sure it's going to maintain safe and fresh cannabis um, uh, as you produce it out and send out to uh, your consumers. All right. So let's understand. Basically, I might be preaching the choir, but we need to understand where terpenes, the majority of terpenes reside uh, on cannabis and specifically on the trichome. Uh, and if we look at this, uh, we'll look at, at this picture. Uh, the majority of the trichomes, uh, the majority of the terpenes uh, reside within the trichome head, uh, along with some cannabinoids. Uh, there's also some uh, security uh, reservoirs. Uh, there's a waxy layer on here. But Trichomes is where uh, the money's at, right? This is where your smell, the majority of the terpenes are going to reside. So if we understand uh, the majority of terpenes reside in the trichome, we need to understand what can happen to these trichomes when humidity control is not put in place. This is a zoomed up picture of uh, trichomes on a strain uh, without humidity control at 12 days. 
Uh, you can see that the trichomes uh, look pretty healthy. The stocks have thinned out quite significantly, uh, but the the head of the trichome, the bulb, uh, is is uh, in a good shape. Now they're pretty clear, uh, so there might be some some curing issues here. Maybe uh, it could have been left on the stock a little bit longer. Uh, but you can see at 12 days without humidity control, we're sitting pretty good. Uh, a little bit of evaporation has happened. Now, if we look at the one month, that same strain, uh, these trichomes have now started to twist. Uh, they're getting tangled up. Uh, some of the heads of the trichomes um, are no longer in that round shape. Uh, it's starting to, to shrink and dehydrate, uh, very similar to how a grape uh, does and or uh, how a raisin gets turned into a, sorry, how a grape gets turned into a raisin. Um, and then ultimately, uh, without humidity control, this is the same strain. Uh, we're sitting at two months. Uh, unrecognizable uh, i don't even see any round shapes on here a lot of these trichomes are so dry and brittle uh, i'd be i would hate to be the consumer when i'd open up my container and i saw this uh majorities would fall off the container and you and i could just imagine how much of a crumble uh this would be so uh really interesting to see how fast um you know water can evaporate uh, without humidity control along with terpenes uh, in this type of a uh, scenario so this is just another graphical uh, representation of what can evaporate uh, off the trichome head. Uh, essentially, on the left side, you've got what looks, you know, obviously the terpenes in, in water being evaporated without humidity control. Uh, this represents, um, you know, not only just evaporation, uh, but without humidity control and without getting it in a good range, that modeler range, which I'll we'll talk about next. The good thing is, is that, we can prevent a, a lot of uh, terpenes from evaporation, specifically when a monolayer of water, pure water vapor, coats those trichomes. Uh, and what happens when you get those in that sweet spot between 55 and 65 percent, that monolayer not only forms, but the higher the RH, it gets really thick. Uh, and it significantly reduces the terpene loss. Um, there's also some other uh, things other than terpene loss. You're going to you know, prevent a lot of evaporation of water. Uh, and cannabinoids can still remain inside your, your trichome. Uh, also, there's some oxidization things uh, that you're going to prevent uh, just by coating those trichomes with that monolayer of water, uh, which is what uh, we're calling the terpene shield. Uh, but it doesn't come without uh, some, some things that uh, uh, you need to be aware of uh, because now we've prevented that evaporation of terpenes. Uh, when you open that container for the first time, uh, and what's going to happen with uh, cannabis when it's in that range of that monolayer range of 55 to 65, you're going to have an absence of terpene smell within that container. And I'm going to tell you that's good because that means that the terpenes are still within your bud, still within those trichomes. So that's good. With humidity control, um, you know, that smell is no longer going to be there. It's going to reside into the point of consumption uh, whenever your consumers try it or when you store it at home. So once we understood this uh, from a science perspective, we really got interested on, on this monolayer and really started to figure out, or we wanted to test um, and, and have some unbiased testing. So we went to a third-party company um, uh, very close to Minneapolis here that tests uh, for different food uh, smells. Uh, they also work uh, with the EPA for OSHA regulations on smelling. Uh, and then believe it or not, uh, they work with uh, some companies that uh, manufacture garbage bags to make sure that they can uh, smell and retain, uh, prevent a lot of this, those uh, garbage smells coming from your kitchen. Mm -hmm. So they are essentially, uh, believe it or not, there are super sensory people out there. And what we did um, is we took unground cannabis and we wanted them to smell in a container the smell intensity of unground cannabis. So the, the bottom, uh, I think that's blue. Is that blue? Yeah, that's blue. I'm colorblind, sorry. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, so in that blue uh, line in the bottom, you can see where they smelled uh, each one of these uh, samples and they measured or they, they recorded the smell intensity, a terpene intensity um, uh, at unground. And at a very low end, around 52 percent, uh, it was extremely low. And then it actually got uh, the intensity got lower as it increased in uh, all up to 62 percent. Interestingly, if we took when we took that same sample and we ground it up and put it in the container and had them smell it again, at that highest range, there was a 20% increase in smell on the intensity. So what's really brought us to another aha moment uh, that 
hey, once this monolayer is formed and you get it inside that range, uh, 55 to 62 is where you're going to hit that sweet spot, right, to maintain that smell. But remember, that's ground. This is a ground cannabis versus unground, right? It kind of it supports the reason why you don't smell that intense terpene hit inside that container. But we didn't stop there. Uh, we really wanted to know uh, what actually is the total terpene content uh, percent that's in uh, this cannabis sample. So we went to another third-party company on, on the uh, the West Coast uh, in California, and we took freshly cured flour, and we, we wanted to see what would happen with bovina and without bovina, uh, essentially no humidity control. Uh, and this was a stability test that ran out for about four months. And what we found is, believe it or not, in that first seven days without humidity control, you lose almost 40% of the terpenes. That's astounding. At 40% of terpenes within that first seven days without humidity control. Uh, and then, obviously, you can see the graph. After that four months without humidity control, we lost almost 60%. Um, but what other thing that we kind of was scratching our head on is, um, you know, this is organic material. Uh, terpenes are always changing. They're always morphing. And, and believe, you know, obviously, this is cannabis. Uh, it wants to deteriorate. It wants to decompose. Uh, so you can kind of see the downward trend um, as well for the terpenes. But that first seven days is so critical because that sets it and locks it in uh, as the days progress uh, with humidity control um, as it relates to the total terpenes preserved. Um, now, this is just one strain that we've tested. Uh, we've got, uh, believe it or not, uh, some more tests in work right now to help support this. Uh, and there might be different terpene profiles that we're looking at uh, that can actually be um, uh, preserved a little bit longer over time uh, at different humidity levels. So our study did not stop. Uh, we were continuously learning over here. Uh, and this is a field test study that we pre, uh, started back in 2018. Uh, and we tested about 150 samples uh, across uh, five different states here in the U.S. Uh, also, we grabbed some samples from Canada, uh, all in different sizes, packaging and styles. We got glass jars, plastic tubes, pouches, you name it. Uh, and reality is, is that only around 20% of those out of 150 samples around that monolayer zone and 80% were below uh, below that 55%. That's that evaporation zone. Um, I mean, man, there are even some down in like the 30% range. Uh, I can't imagine what that will look like when you open up your container. Uh, but the good news is we didn't find any that were above, uh, above 65, right? So no mold occurred. Uh, so that's good. So, uh, you know, uh, people are doing things uh, ad adequately to make sure that... Uh, uh, you know, it's safe and for consumers as well. So just to recap here, uh, the absence of terpene smell in your container with humidity control is good. Uh, keep focusing on those trichomes and evaporated trichomas lost, not just terpenes, but a lot of water and is exposing it to oxidization. Uh, keep your cannabis in that range, right? That monolayer range, uh, that present, pre prevents a lot of that evaporation. It keeps it nice and healthy and keeps those terpenes uh, locked in. Uh, and then obviously, you know, uh, you're going to also, once you're in that range, your trichomes are going to be uh, flexible. Uh, they're not going to break off during transportation uh, and, and help preserve those cannabinoids um, all the way through. So let's just look at without... Uh, Without evapor without humidity control, what can happen in a typical supply chain? Uh, you're going to produce and harvest, and then post harvest are where you really need to make sure that humidity control is placed uh, put in place. Uh, once it leaves your hands, like I said, it's out of your control. You're not going to know what's going to happen. And look at all these touch points, maybe seven to eight different touch points until it reaches the end consumer. So adding and those and those are all points where evaporation can happen. Um, obviously, your trucks aren't going to be uh, humidity controlled. Uh, your retail area is not going to be humidity controlled. So um, why not add it up in front and make sure that it's controlled all the way through to prevent evaporation? Uh, just typical. And now this could be even, uh, could be two months, could be uh, six months from what I've heard uh, from some LPs and also some uh, some growers around in the U.S. Uh, from the time you package to the end uh, use. All right. So there, uh, let's recap again. Uh, again, so what evaporates when a bud is harvested at a farm uh, until it reaches your local dispensary without that monolayer. Uh, obviously, terpenes, you're going to get the loss of smell and taste. That's important. Uh, you're also going to get overly dry bud, which equals that compromised trichome health. 
And then the last thing here, the third thing I'll touch on uh, on these coming slides is the water weight, right? We distill so by weight, water is weight. If you lose that water to evaporation, that's a loss of revenue as well. And we'll show some examples here. So uh, I've got two different scenarios here. Uh, <clears throat> on the left-hand side, you've got to start uh, cannabis. Uh, so you've got 1,000 pounds, uh, roughly around $5 per, per gram here. It's sitting around 50% relative humidity. At its standing uh, moment, uh, you've, it's around $2.2 .2 million. Uh, just a small 5% drop in RH is roughly around a $15,000 loss just to water evaporation. Now, that's just water evaporation. Now, look at because we're below that range of 55 this 45 is below there you've now sacrificed your trichome health you've lost terpenes from evaporation uh your cannabinoids are sacrificed uh and uh you, you it's just gonna look um like crappy weed uh in, in your containers so um but that's amazing just a five point uh drop is about a fifteen thousand dollars loss to evaporation and what's going to happen is you know when somebody purchases your weed at that point um, you know, they're going to slam me on social media. It's incorrect weight. Uh, it's too dry. I'm going back to the black market. Um, a lot of things that could happen uh, when it evaporates out, right? You're going to pack a one gram container. By the time it gets to somebody, it could be below one gram because uh, they're going to weigh it most likely when they get home. Three things that are imperative here, right? As a cultivator, because you've lost that 5%, you've lost that revenue. Uh, dispensaries, uh, aren't going to be able to sell as much. And then as a consumer, you're going to be unhappy, right? I'm going to open, I'm going to pay good money to pay uh, for cannabis. I open this up and it's just going to be evaporated and just look horrible. They're not going to go back to the dispensary. So it's a lose, lose, lose. However, this can be prevented. Now let's look at the same scenario. Let's start at around 50% humidity. Uh, again, we got a thousand grams at $5 per gram. If we just increase this uh, with to 12%, right? Get it in that monolith range of 62% rehydrate. That's roughly around $48,000 gain in revenue just by adding humidity control and bringing it into that monolith range. So you're adding on the revenue. You're making sure that's in that monolith range. Your trichome is, health is phenomenal. You're preventing a lot of the terpenes from evaporation. And it's just a, a great um, uh, a present presentation. Um, you know, you're going to have squishy buds at that 62% as well. Uh, it's not going to crumble and break uh, as well when you when a consumer opens up that package. All right, different scenario here, right? Everybody's happy. You made money. Dispensaries can sell it, and consumers are getting some really good bud, some really kind bud here. So, uh, win, win, win. So just to recap here, uh, the RH control can maximize profits by A, uh, first one is creating that modeling of water on the trichomes that locks in terps and the cannabinoids. Uh, you're also going to maintain that healthy and hardy and hydrated trichome. Uh, you're going to keep your cannabis safe uh, and hydrated between 55 and 65%. And then lastly, a preserved package. Uh, weight, uh, you're going to prevent mold and you're going to avoid uh, a lot of potential costly recalls if that RH jumps up and you don't have that humidity control. Now mold is going to set in. And once it sets in, it goes very fast. That's it. Thank you very much, everybody. And I guess we'll turn it over to some questions. Yeah. Awesome. That was great, guys. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess the first question so what, what do you have in your toolbox or what ways can you help LPs kind of approve your product for use inside facilities in Canada? Yeah, great question, Troy. Um, we have a lot of documentation around uh, just our quality docs, we call them. So these are all your food safe uh, qualifications, um, our GMP facility, ISO, uh, ISO 1000, or is it 9001-2015, um, so we have all those documentations to, uh, you know, prove out our product is safe and acceptable to use. We also have some uh, writing from Health Canada that uh, goes into detail about how Boveda's accepted use of, uh, you know, a, a product for use in cannabis storage um, and final packaging. Um, and then, you know, we're willing to to come out to your facility. I guess we can't right now because of COVID, but uh, in theory, we will work with you to kind of get a baseline of where your products are at. So uh, the great thing with water activity, it's easy to test. 
Um, so we have partners up in Canada, one of them being Grow House Supply. They have uh, the ability to come to your facility and test your water activity of the cannabis and give you kind of a real world uh, scenario of where things are at. And then, uh, you know, build out a plan to, to improve that and get you into that 0.55 and point uh, between 0.55 and 0.65 water activity. Um, we have other customer examples, too. So we work with, uh, you know, roughly 60 of the LPs across Canada in some uh, way, shape or form. So there's also case studies there and uh, customer testimonials. That's awesome. Yeah, I've seen that some of the uh, water activity testing done by Grow House. It's pretty eye opening for sure. So yeah. we have a couple more questions coming in here from the audience. Um, so kind of on that subject of data, do you have any data to show THC degradation in low humidity over dried cannabis? Uh, so specifically THC degradation, uh, different humidity levels. Um, you know what? We're not really seeing anything um, specifically that's standing out that THC is degrading uh, with and without humidity control. Uh, obviously, uh, some of the measurements that are out there that um, the labs are providing on a COA is all based on water weight, right? So you can, uh, uh, it's presented as a THC uh, over the total moisture content. Um, so we don't see any degradation uh, at the moment. Um, however, we are digging into a lot of the tests right now that we are kicking off on uh, a more specific detailed study that not only will measure the terpenes, but cannabinoids and THC moving forward. So little teaser. Uh, it's going to take a while for us to get the data, but uh, it's coming. Awesome. That's great. So another one. Uh, so we've talked a lot about terpenes, seeing the pictures of healthy versus unhealthy glands. What is the impact on cannabinoids? Is the RH range the same to maintain terpenes and cannabinoid, cannabinoid levels the same? So you pretty much just answered that one as well. Um, another one, what's the best way to measure water activity or RH? Great, great question. Uh, so there's water activity machines. There's a few different options out there in terms of uh, companies that manufacture them. Uh, there's tabletop ones that are a little bit more expensive that you're going to find, you know, in a facility or in your lab. Uh, and then they actually make these handheld ones that are really cool. That's called the pocket, I believe, yeah. uh, from meter group. And you can, uh, you know, essentially walk around with it in your facility and go out, test different batches from different, uh, you know, storage bins. Um, and then also that's been used to, to go into, you know, retail setting and buy some cannabis off the shelf from a retail store in Canada uh, or in the States, and then you can test it right there. So um, that gives you the ability to see where your cannabis is at when a consumer would consume it versus, you know, where it's at in your facility, which typically are, are two very different numbers um, due to the long supply chain. One thing I do, um, <clears throat> not everybody has one of these water activity meters. Uh, another way to, to essentially measure this is, uh, if you've got a canning jar, a small jar, and you've got a calibrated hygrometer, you can put that hygrometer in with your cannabis, close it up and seal it. And it may take, you know, 24 hours. Uh, but after 24 hours, take a look at that, uh, your hygrometer. And that's another way to uh, get a good uh, snapshot of, uh, you know, that water activity level um, as well with your cannabis. I'm just trying to have one uh, actually right over here that you uh, you guys sent me. It, it works very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and, and uh, you know, if if anyone's interested in learning more about these water activity machines, they can reach out. I don't know if my contact or Brian's will be somewhere, but uh, we feel free to reach out to us, and we can put you in touch with uh, Meter Group or some of the other uh, companies out there that make these machines. Great. We got a lot more questions coming in here. Um, so and just another kind of follow up question. It's just surprising that even when the glands shrink and become, become dehydrated, there wouldn't be any cannabinoid lost. Uh, but here's a, another good question. So does the bovoda pack touching the cannabis degrade or break down the flower in any way? That was always what we thought. Yeah, no, that was... Uh kind of a myth that was started years ago, uh, really more specifically in the Canadian uh, industry for some reason. I think a, a lot of it stemmed from just uh, Health Canada and the concern that, you know, we weren't going to be compliant 
from that standpoint. But no, there is no, obviously, if you're thro- shaking a jar and there's a bovida pack in there and you're moving it all around, uh, you know, that could damage the cannabis just like anything else. But there's nothing that bovida is going to give off or or take away or do uh, in that sense to damage or harm the product. It's again, like Brian said, it's all food safe. So it's acceptable to come in contact with cannabis or food or anything else of that nature. And, and uh, it's not going to give off anything being that close in contact. It's giving off purified water vapor and that's it. Awesome. I think that would definitely, uh, definitely a question. I'm sure you get a lot from LPs when they're, they're adding it to their product. Yep. How, how many or what what percentage of products in the Canadian market would you estimate have contain bovida uh, right now? Yeah, I don't know the percentage. I mean, I I know there's a good twenty to maybe thirty brands on the the rec and medical side that include a small bovida inside of uh, you know their final package product, and then like I said, there's upwards of sixty that use bovida on their back end storage. Uh, side of things and maybe more um but from what we can see that's you know a close guesstimate that's great i'll have to keep my eyes open for those ones <laughs> i think that's pretty much it uh, unless laura has any more questions no it looks like that is all we have for questions today so thank you so much to the team at bovida and um, i did put the url in the chat but what would be the best way for anybody who wants to follow up with you? Yeah, I mean, I can give my personal email. I'd love to chat with anyone that wants to go deeper into to any of these topics. Or if you're interested in, in setting something up where you want to get your cannabis tested by, you know, Grow House or, or us directly, uh, we can do that for sure. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to, to just chat. So I can give my personal email and, and number if that works. Yeah, same here. If you have some technical questions, you want to expand more on these, uh, after you, just, you digest this a little further, I'd be happy to uh, jump on a call too. Troy, are you able to maybe just throw um, our emails in the chat? or Yeah, or I can, I can probably option? do that for sure. Absolutely. So while Troy is working on that, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you and thank you to our audience for joining us today. And there were some questions about if this was being recorded and if they'd be able to rewatch. So yes, this presentation was recorded. So keep an eye on your emails. We will be sending a follow-up email with a link to watch the recording of the webinar, as well as a few additional resources. So thank you again to everybody for joining us. And we hope to see you at our next webinar. Yeah, thanks thank you. everyone. Appreciate it. And hopefully oh, uh, connect with some of you around terpene degradation. Sure. I'm just writing the emails in the chat. Sorry about that. I copied and pasted and it just sent your names there. So it'll be there in a bit, but thanks everyone. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks guys.